Welcome, everybody. My name is Tomasz Wrubewski, and I uh, would like to invite you all the warmly, all the, our distinguished guests and all the panelists. Uh, my name is Tomasz Wrubewski, also at the Price Institute, but I also want to invite everybody on behalf of uh, Economic Freedom Foundation and uh, uh, Fundacja Wolności i Przedsiębiorczości. We all try to put all of our effort to organize this event. Uh, for the uh, last 17 years, uh, uh, Market Roadshow has been tackling all the most pressing social economic issues around the world and uh, trying to propose some free market recommendations to all the issues and challenges uh, we face today and for the last 17 years. Uh, to put it mildly, uh, probably our not all our recommendation found a very fertile, line, fertile ground in the minds of politicians and decision makers. So since then, we have uh, just most crises and even more challenges to face, and we have to take more even pro-market stand. That's something we're going to do today as well as uh, before, but the uh, world is even more, uh, less free, more complicated, and more challenging. Well, we do have a lot of optimistic things, like we have much more people uh, looking for our publications, looking into free market solutions. We have even one government in the country which is very socialistic and populist in Argentina that is trying their best, and we really uh, hope for them that, that they're using pro-market, free market solutions that they will be able to pull this country out of this mess, and we hope this could be also uh, some direction for all of us. Um, most of all, I would like to uh, extend warm greetings uh, from Barbara uh, Colm, the founder of Free Market Road, uh, Roadside. And she founded it, and uh, she couldn't be here with us, but she want to also invite everybody, all the panelists and all the, the guests at the meeting. Barbara specifically sends her regards to local hosts. Uh, and Marek Tatawa, uh, who is, rejoins FMRS uh, with Economic Freedom Foundation, and Sebastian Stodolak, who is also a member of the same organization, I'm also Enterprise <coughs> Institute and uh, they put all the work and effort to make this event uh, happen. I have a letter from Barbara. I would like to read it to all. Uh, and uh, just a short, but I think very moving. Um, more than 15 years ago, Free Market Roadshow started out of uh, in four capitals, Bratislava, Vienna, Prague, and Berlin, with a couple of speakers and a total of 300 attendees. Now, 17 years later, we run up to 50 conferences annually in more than 35 countries and are proud of the network that we have built. The FMRS is uh, not only an academic event at the university, but also addresses also public policy issues with an uh, entrepreneurial journalistic and policy-oriented audience. We have anticipated topics and issues long before they were discussed by broader public. The migration crisis that had hit Europe in 2015 was a main topic of 2014 MRS. Equally, the sovereign debt crisis was discussed in 2008, when everybody still thought that US mortgage crisis will only affect few banks uh, in Europe. There will be more examples, but we ask you now to go ahead and discuss and solve tomorrow problems. As I mentioned, we have them more than ever, and uh, free market stand is needed more than ever. So this would will start uh, our discussion. Thank you for coming, and uh, hope you have a pleasant day. Um, I would like also to um, ask you to, like, with all the solutions, as I mentioned, and we are proposed, we also, this time, we have uh, uh, 
proposal of uh, mm, the petition to be signed. You will find the uh, QCore uh, code here that you can pick it up. But this it, is just mainly it's uh, petition uh, pertaining to the need of reforms, mainly in the EU, but not only. Uh, it is to ensure free and prosperous future. We call upon policymakers across Europe and globally to embrace the following critical policy changes. Uh, to reduce regulations and taxes focusing on core government functions and enabling entrepreneurial growth. Reform the EU and its institutions prioritize regional sovereignty, trade, openness, and less central, centralized regulations. Liberalize market, particularly in energy, housing, to foster free market solution and reduce state control. So again, you can pick it up from here and also be co-signing. Um, also, we would like to encourage you to take part of uh, our questionnaire. There are a few uh, questions we'd like you to ask to participate in our project. There is another Q code you could pick it up, and we appreciate if you uh, take part of it. This is uh, our start, and now we'll go to the panel, as I understand. With the first panel, uh, uh, we ask uh, Prince Michael of Liechtenstein, financial entrepreneur and ge geopolitics expert. We also invite Ignacy Moravsky, Chief Economist of Pulse Business. Gentlemen. Okay, the title of our panel today is uh, to privatize, privatize or not to privatize. Uh, and as puzzling as it sounds, uh, the problem quite often is answer to not to privatize. For last years, probably since crisis of 2008, through pandemia, we saw very mm, abrupt, uh, activity of the government. This is not something very surprising because in the past, every time we have a crisis, governments uh, is expected to be more involved in uh, economy and be more energetic and be more, uh, uh, how to say, uh, aggressive in their policies. But the question we have today, after all those years since the 2008, and the uh, crisis of pandemia, do we really uh, believe still that we can go back to the private uh, entrepreneurial <coughs> dominance economy, more free market economy? Can, is it possible still to have the world which is not uh, over-regulated and over-controlled by government? Do we still have a space for privatization? So the question I would like to start with, gentlemen, just for the beginning, very general. Uh, where are we at? Is a state we are in, it is something we shall be expecting to be lasting for another 100 years, or it's a typical transformation period from the crisis to the new reality? So, uh, Good evening and thank you for, for inviting me and I'm uh, very excited to, to be here. Now the um, uh, question is always looking in the future is, is not so, so easy to, to say. I think there is a general belief now if we hear the, uh, the, the politicians from Warsaw to Brussels etc. that a strong state involvement in the economy is necessary. This is a strong. Um, if uh, we look in economic history, we, uh, we can see that has never has brought much prosperity. It has not, it uh, <coughs> limits innovation, it increases bureaucracy, 
and increases the <coughs> overhead costs of government. Uh, this is a, a, a general way. There are waves, and I remember the advantage of uh, privatization. I remember when that was now about 30 years ago when Austria joined the European uh, community. At that time, the Euro com European community was standing for deregulation and privatization. Austria had a very heavy nationalized industry and was, if, if we look at GDP per capita, had about half of Western Germany. Austria had to privatize. All these big state uh, groups were uh, put into pieces, and actually it had a very good economic uh, de development at, at, at that stage, bringing actually Austria to one of the leading um, G GDP per capita countries now of, of the European Union. So the your recommendation is to privatize it to uh, and yeah. as, a, as a development. On the other hand, the question is, um, after 2008 and the banking crisis, uh, we saw uh, strong involvement of uh, government and regulations to prevent further uh, crisis. And actually, we since then, we didn't have such a uh, dramatic crisis since 2008 when it comes to financial. And so the government was uh, actually a solution for, for the problem, not privatization, but uh, more involvement, governmental involvement. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, okay. Uh, uh, this is, I, I think, at this stage in 2008, I think the central banks realized that it needs liquidity into in, into the in the into the, the market. I think they handled uh, the banking crisis uh, quite well. I doubt that it was necessary then to uh, to maintain such a high uh, government involvement, and I think it it will also not avoid any banking crisis um, in, the, in, the, in the future. Um, I think, in, in my opinion, it would have been better, well, to, to, sometimes one, one, has, one, one needs a short-term uh, government intervention. <coughs> this, this, uh, this can happen. I don't deny it. But otherwise, I think the, bet the best solution would have been, as the U.S. did, actually forcing the banks to have higher equity pro uh, proportions. Thank you, Ignacy Moravsky. The question, okay, uh, question will be about uh, ongoing discussion in Poland about uh, privatization, how far the privatization went, and that uh, a lot of uh, mm, mm, uh, inequality in Poland, a lot of uh, economic problems, and uh, uneven growth in Poland is actually due to over-privatization, that we did it too fast and too much of our industry went to the private hands without uh, uh, proper share to uh, whole society. Uh, okay, thank you for inviting me. Uh, just uh, to, to introduce, I, I, you know, the, the name of the panel is Freedom Fights, so I'm prepared to fight. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, um, I'm a monk, uh, very liberal audience. Um, I'm also more or less liberal, but maybe not as much as you, so I will try to take some contrary positions in some arguments, not because I'm generally uh, against private enterprise, but for the sake of the, of the discussion. So, <coughs> uh, I, I would say yes. Where, where you asked first where we are today. So in general, if I had to describe the, the current world, we are in a period of slow growth, disappointing growth. And the second thing, I agree with you, we are in, in an in a era where there is a growing conviction that governments have to intervene more. And the question is whether there is some relation between, between those two phenomena. Right? Do we have slow growth because we have increasing interventionism? Or maybe on the contrary, we have increasing interventionism because of slow growth. Uh, I don't know whether some of you, uh, somebody among the audience, read the famous book by Joseph Schumpeter, 
Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy. Have you read it? Who read it? Right. That's, that, this is a great book. So what Schumpeter wrote about uh, private enterprise, public enterprise, he said that the, the, when you have a, uh, a stagnant economy, economy that is not going through technological disruptions, through large changes, right? Economy that is not growing. There is no huge difference between private enterprise or uh, publicly owned enterprise, right? So the, the causality is in different direction that we, than, than we often imagine. If we live in a world that is quite stagnant, and moreover, we live in the world w which is dominated by large corporations, Right? That large corporations which, are, which have uh, spread ownership, then there is no huge efficiency difference between various types of ownership. So my, what, what I want to say is that maybe increasing interventionism is a natural reaction to how the world is organized, how economy performs, how technology changes. You know, there are a lot of... Uh, uh, um, popular thesis that we have a, a stagnant technological, uh, I would say, that we don't have technological progress nowadays as fast as before. You can see that in various indicators, uh, despite all the hype around AI and digitization, the, 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 the general impact of technological progress on efficiency growth is quite low. So what I want to say is that maybe the, the causality is different. We live in a world that is more stagnant, dominated by corporations. So naturally, people accept increasing interventionism. And that might be the case of Poland also, right? So we, uh, people accept increasing interventionism because they, they saw that uh, privatizing everything do not bring uh, like the world that they imagined, right? Maybe the, the, the spread benefits of the free market economy, too much inequality. Uh, but I think that Poland, you know, some trends in Poland are a bit different than worldwide. So, um, so I, I just want to interrupt for sure. I mean, probably in ideal, ideal world, when you have a privatization and uh, nationalization, and you've got the government uh, as a responsible player uh, playing responsibly, you could understand there's no much difference. But there's uh, government is always politicizing the economic, economic process. And this is something we always face, that uh, it's not only more, most costly, but also it tends to use some, um, uh, put ideology a lot into their economic process, and from there the, the problem starts. So okay, but do you believe that private corporations are free of politics? They are not. They are clearly engaged in various ways. So you, you can see politics in private enterprises and public enterprises. Moreover, if you look at Poland, wh what type of companies were, uh, went, to the pub like went back to public ownership? Mainly companies in energy sector or banking sector. So sectors that are in general not going through large disruptions, right? If you take the company like Orlen, this is like a, this is like a bureaucracy, a stagnant company that you can manage like a, like a ministry. And actually, if you look at efficiency indicators of Orlen, which is the largest Polish oil, oil company, uh, publicly owned, or state owned actually, not, not publicly owned in English term, but state owned, you don't see huge efficiency differences between Orlen and let's say BP, Shell, or Western privately owned companies. So I don't see like uh, major arguments against the state owning big, uh, big companies in stagnant sectors. Okay, the prince, does it really make uh, no difference whether they, it's a private or a state-owned company, especially in the times of the growth? Uh, well, I think in, in, uh, it depends really how the company is, is managed. And I think that there is a point there are uh, companies who are like battleships who like paddle ships uh, who, who don't move very much. 
Frequently, they are utilities because they have a quasi-monopoly uh, character, which is which is actually ne ne never good, but 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 this happens. But I think it's sometimes the well the political influence for the appointment of the management is maybe less big if it is uh, let's say uh, privately owned. And there, I think we have to make also a difference between entrepreneurial companies and managerial large companies. There, there, there is entrepreneurial companies are normally more dynamic, which is also a, a generalization. So I still believe there is more efficiency when, when, when it's privately owned. But we, we more or less agree that the answer to the question, privatized or not, depends on circumstances. Yeah. That it's not like unilateral answer in uh, regardless of the environment that we live in. Yeah. I, I, no, uh, you, you can't say it has to be privatized immediately, etc. It has also to be done uh, with, um, I would say, with common sense. Well, there's quite often an argument that um, uh, privatization, the process of privatization, brings probably faster growth, more efficient uh, economy, but at the same time brings more unemployment, sometimes uh, uh, bigger uh, differences uh, in society, discrepancies between rich and, and poor, and that it causes also more uh, internal problems. There are also hostile takeovers that people, a lot of people are use, losing jobs or all the branches of economy disappear. Something which uh, with uh, nationally or state owned companies happens very rarely. So that there's an argument that why also some sort of state control could be safer and better for society, for economy as, a, as general. I think we have to see here also sometimes short time, medium time, and, and, and long time. Uh, certainly it might be if you break up, let's say, an inefficient larger company, there will be people redundant. And what can happen with these people? Is the economy strong enough to take them over? Because normally these people are also capable of, 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 of doing something and might be used more efficiently somewhere. That's why I said before it has to be done with certain common sense at the right time. But I think in general, if companies become too big and inefficient, something should be done because for the, or the long term, an inefficient work and inefficient use of human resources and of people is not only unfair to the people, but it's also very unfair to the economy. In Poland, we have uh, around 700 companies which are state-owned or partially state-owned, and a lot of them are not big like Orlen, that you can say it's like a ministry, but a lot of them are small, inefficient, uh, not very with uh, bad performance. Oh, uh, yes, they are paying salaries, but very low salaries, and they are not really a challenge for a market. But they just survived quite often thanks to subsidies. So is it helpful for a market to, to help to survive those companies, or this is actually uh, like a pest on economy? Well, a, a very good question. I think we should uh, go into the details. What kind of companies are we talking about? Because uh, let's, ta let's take uh, uh, companies like, you know, the uh, uh, Polish mountain, uh, I don't know how to translate it, Polish mountain lines, you know, which operate the Polskie Koleje Linowe, how to translate it, everyone. Cable lines, okay, thank you very much. So they were first privatized and then taken back by the state. Now, I, as, as, as a person who uses sometimes the service, I really don't see a, a, a huge difference like Maybe even there was more investment uh, done by the state than by the private uh, uh, investor because of the fact that this is kind of a natural monopoly. But in general, 
I agree that there are a lot of inefficiencies because of the state ownership of various small companies in sectors that should be dominated by private enterprise. So here I agree, this is true. But why does it happen? I think that this is a, an answer of the political system. This is, this is a way to finance a political system. Okay, I can say it this way. Every country needs a way to finance political system, political parties, experts, uh, all the people that work for the political organizations. If you take United States, for example, and you have a, if you have a change of the government, right, so there is a, a switch between Democrats and Republicans, you have a, a huge number of private organizations that take care of those um, uh, public employees who are made redundant, right? They, they, they find work in some private foundations, enterprises, so they can easily uh, go on living. In Poland, we don't have such an environment. So uh, if you have a, uh, if you have a, a, a well-skilled uh, public official who works in, let's say, Ministry of Finance, and he loses his job because of the political difficult to, uh, to, 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 to find yourself on the labor market. So, This one? Okay. So uh, every political system need maybe every political system needs a way to finance politicians, right? Uh, so to me, this is like a second best solution of the Polish system. We have all those a huge number of, of public of, of state owned enterprises where politicians on the local level can find work. And thanks to that, political parties can function, can provide, uh, like every country need pol needs political parties, right? So we, thanks to that, we can have, I would say, f function and functioning political system. So is it good or bad? I mean, it's certainly not the best world that we can imagine. But I think this is kind of like sometimes economists say about second best solutions. So you cannot find the, fe the, the best solution, so you, you go the way that you can practically can go. So basically you're saying that the social, uh, the state-owned enterprise and less privatization is due to the social structure, the, the way how many people are working. The second largest group of uh, employees in Poland are uh, working for government. The first b biggest one is the people who are uh, getting subsidies from the government. I'm not talking of pins at plus, uh, or I'm not talking even retirement, but the largest group is that some they, they receive somehow subsidies. So this is a huge group of people who put the pressure on government. And probably we have a similar problem uh, in other European countries, that we can talk about better solutions, what would be better for economy, but n not necessarily democracy would uh, allow that. This is a this is a, a, a difficult question. It's a, a, a difficult question. I think the problem of subsidies we we have we we we, we have everywhere, and <coughs> I think certain system we need social systems. We 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 need also systems to uh, to subsidize. I know we can't do very quick changes, but I think still. If we want to have, and we are also, we are not in an ivory tower in, in, in Europe. On the long term, we are in a global competition. And we also have a um, shrinking demography. So if, 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 if I look at, at these things, I think we still have to see that we use sort of the capacities of our people, because we have in Europe very well educated, a, a good wealth uh, uh, workforce, that we use them, not that we exploit them, but, but, but we use their skill at the best, w uh, the best we can. And I don't think that this is, if we uh, 
try to optimize there, that will be a danger to, uh, uh, to democracy. Um, and uh, and, and it's, it's not what, what, you, what, what, you, what you said. Uh, you said we need, um, let's, say, subs uh, uh, let's say, put it that way, subsidies for democracy and also a sort of a field where we can put people who are losing their jobs because for democratic reasons, no, not, not, not that they are uh, sad. Uh, Yes, it's certainly not very, uh, very efficient. It's probably also, if we look at the size of the economy and the number of people who lose in Washington their job, it's not such a big uh, sh uh, sh uh, share of the total. Um. <laughs> One, one of the things that uh, we are uh, approaching, we're talking about the climate changes, you mentioned demography, which is another challenging problem, and we assume that uh, the only solution is a state, and state intervention, uh, state solutions for the problem, and uh, very rarely we see and hear about uh, private sector solution for the climate change. So uh, the thing is that in an environment where you assume that the biggest challenges of the world, the solution is within the state, it's very, it's very difficult to even imagine that the private sector would take over, I mean, would show a new way. I mean, with a new uh, Europe, EU uh, regulation on ESG, we assume that capitalism is something wrong. The capitalist has no answer for our future problems in the social problems or uh, climate. We assume that state or, or institutions have to impose regulations on the private sector and change capitalism from inside to be an answer for uh, biggest challenges. So the question is, are we really have even a space for a uh, uh, growth of private entrepreneur? D or this will be, even if this will be private, it will be so deeply controlled by the state and regulation and institutions that it's a little like with a banking system or energy. Even if th there is like, as Morawski mentioned, even if it's pr uh, private, it's so regulated, it behaves like uh, uh, national, um, Na na national company. Uh, so d do we really have a space even to grow of uh, private uh, private sector and uh, to develop without government over, in, uh, over uh, interventionism? Uh, very good question. But I, uh, first, I totally reject the idea that we can fight climate change totally without government involvement. This is, there is a clear externality. I, I think that 99.9% .9 of economists would agree with that, that there is a clear externality involved here. So externality, it means that you create costs, right, that are not uh, fully uh, uh, covered by you, right? If you pollute the, 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 the environment, then you impose costs on others. So there is an externality. But an interesting issue, very interesting, is whether we should tackle the externality only by simple regulations like taxes. Let's, let's tax carbon emissions. And that's it. That's, that, uh, that, I would say this is the liberal idea. Impose carbon tax and leave everything else to the private sector. So if private sector has a right incentive and it observes higher carbon price, it will innovate it will invest, it will change the, the landscape. So this is the liberal idea. Now, more I would say American, although it depends on which administration is in, is in power or, or which party. Well, uh, the, the more, I would say, socialist idea or left-wing idea is to rely more on regulations and what is recently uh, Fa uh, I would say a popular idea in economics, directed technological change. 
So an, an, here is an idea that the government should impose not only taxes to tackle externalities, but also clear and direct regulations on which uh, technologies should be developed. So to me, this is the, the, the key division, right? Where simple taxes to, to tackle externality or uh, a plethora of regulations to direct technological change. Now, which option is better? It's very, to, for me, it's very difficult to answer. I don't have a clear idea. To me, it seems that the European, uh, the European way, so the heavy regulations, is, is hitting the wall. Right, so it's it's more and more difficult to impose on everyone all those targets for emissions, for agricultural uh, change, like landscapes, and uh, uh, on automotive sector, um, emitting industries, uh, imports, exports, carbon taxes, uh, carbon border tax. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, uh, direct regulations, and more and more. Uh, protests against it. So I think that Europe has a, uh, has a clear political problem that the type of regulations that European Union imposed generates more and more um, opposition. On the other hand, I, I'm not really convinced that the simple idea to impose a carbon tax and leave everything else to the private sector will work. I don't know. Well, I think basically I, I, I agree with, with you. I think uh, you can't leave it to the state to tell also the private sector to tell the whole economy how to do it. But we, but we need uh, government to impose certain rules, like, for instance, the carbon tax or, 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 or some, some other ones to, mm, uh, to limit things or to... Uh, the, uh, the, the, the direct things and then let the market work. I think we will also have uh, instances where, let's say, the private sector can't bring the solution and that we, we might need the, the state there. But I think it should be tried to keep this to, 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 to really a minimum. And I think we will have to tr uh, to try to give rather the incentives there, not financial incentives, but the incentives by the regulation that the private sector is strongly engaged in that. And I think when, when I see businesses, businesses try already since a long time to be clean, to, uh, uh, to, to, to give a good example, etc. And we have made certain mistakes by populist uh, uh, politics, which you can see, for instance, in the German energy policy, which is a total disaster. And so, uh, yes, I'm, I'm on your side, but maybe with a little bit less state involvement. Thank you so much. No, in, in a way, we do have this experiment um, ongoing uh, since 2008 when the European Union started imposing a lot of very interventionist regulations. This is like a stream of uh, regulations and very broad. It's not only environment but also technology, AI, uh, the, the digital, uh, um, uh, digital uh, regulations. If we observe what happens to GDP, comparing EU GDP to GDP of United States, that when we were at around 90% of uh, US GDP in 2008, now we are 50%. And pretty much if you look almost of any indicator um, that will show that uh, Europe is more and more staying behind United States, so you would say that uh, the, the, we know the answer, what, what regulations are uh, better and what are the worst. So the, the question is, um, is there a way out of this policy of, uh, even if Ignacy Moravsky says, over interventionism, over regulation, and uh, no success? Is there a way back? I mentioned ESG which is a law in European Union, and it's 
almost died in the United States. Because if you, on an open market, and if you start comparing uh, numbers between uh, how the funds uh, operating on ESG terms, uh, what the profits and regular funds are profits, then you know that it's better to go back to original model. In Europe, it is a law, and we, are, we took this road. So the question is, is a way out? What would have to happen uh, that we look back into privatization? 1980s, uh, when we change from a very strongly interventionist governments in Europe and the United States, um, we probably have, this was economy that people decided that it's too bad and we have to change it, we have to go back to uh, is, it, is it possible that would happen in Europe if we keep degrading uh, European economy? Is there any point where someone will come up and say, that's it, we have to change the way we are operating and go more in, uh, into private entrepreneurs than uh, state? The question is whether a, a low growth in Europe compared to US is caused by overregulation or not. I'm not sure. Well, Europe is a different model than US model. Okay, so Europe is certainly more regulated, but also more uh, accustomed to some social rights. Right? So it's uh, in general the, the amount of work, the number of hours of work are lower in Europe than the United States. You have less dynamism. Uh, maybe less competition, more regulations, more, uh, I would say, uh, free time. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at uh, various well-being indicators, like either happiness indexes or human development indexes, or let's take one of the most important indicators, life expectancy. What is GDP growth? GDP is not something you can touch. It's not something you can see. L let's look at some real indicators, like life expectancy, how long people live. It is an indication of, of development. So in this aspect, Europe is more developed than the United States. So to me, it is not clear that Europe is behind the US. Europe is different. It's to, to me, it's clear that Europe has to have lower income because it is not a technological frontier to the same extent as United States. So all the most important technologies are created in US. So US has a premium in GDP per capita. And to me, it's fair to have such a premium at around 20%. So if Europe, on average, stays, uh, stays at around 75, 80% uh, um, in GDP per capita with respect to United States, to me, that's fine. This is the price worth paying for a different social model. So I'm not fully convinced that overregulation is a, co is, a, is, a, is, a, is a huge problem for Europe, although I agree that there are some areas like climate policy where where a huge wave of regulations is difficult to understand. Like just recently, two months ago, in almost in the middle of farmer protests, European Commission introduced a new climate uh, uh, target for emission reduction for 2040. So we, ha we had already had this target of zero emissions in 2050, minus 65% in 2030. And in February, European Commission proposed additional target for 2040. So even pe when I talked to experts uh, of, from climate policy, even they did not understand it. So I agree that there might be like too much of regulation, too much of uh, <coughs> like uh, uh, steering mentality that we can steer everything, steer, right, Di direct everything. But in general, looking from the from the white perspective, I'm I'm not convinced that overregulation is a is a problem of Europe. Well, the question was. Um, can we come back to maybe a more equivalent uh, position? And if I look back, and it, it doesn't worry me too much, the uh, figures of, of GDP, 
But we need in Europe one thing, we, we need, uh, um, let's say, for our prosperity, a longer term view. We, we need more, more private sector because I don't think we will sustain and we are not and we will not be able to sustain our social system which also guarantees us the life expectancy and, and, and the present levels. So, so, so we need a stronger economy and more probably in the more, I would say, productive areas than in the controlling and administrative areas. And I don't mean on the factories, but we need less, uh, let's say, cost of regulation, cost of compliance uh, to, uh, to, uh, to become more effective. Now, how should we change it? Now, as you said, that we have constantly new rules. That means also that people coming out of the productive side into the controlling side, because the rules must be enforced, they must be controlled, et, et cetera. This is my, my big concern. On top of it, we have, and this is not only in Europe, this is globally, but it can strike quite strong in Europe, is that basically our society, our states, are running out of money. We have these huge debts. We have to do something about it. And I could imagine that we will see the consequences of this policy in a, a reduced prosperity. And that might give, let's say, on one side, also social unrest, political unrest, we see already that the democracy is reducing in, in Europe. We have on the ref, uh, left and on the right side, we have quite a, a strength in groups of all the unhappy people. And I think we need also to do the necessary economic things to come back to, let's say, a better a prosperity, and I think we can only do this to strengthening the system. But maybe we have, as we had it in the uh, late 70s, that we have really problems increasing unemployment, which, which I don't hope, that will f force us and will, will change the mentality, et, et cetera. But it will be difficult. Uh, yeah, longevity is, uh, is a point, a strong point, that in the U.S. Uh, people live longer, in, I mean, in Europe people in general uh, live longer than the United States for ver various reasons, but then again, um, when you take a lot of our indexes like uh, uh, disposable income, it's much higher in the U.S. than uh, in Europe. If you look at the best uh, universities, best school, terms of performance in the U.S. and Europe, well, even China, uh, and Japan, Asia, universities comparing to European, they are f falling down. They are not improving. They are just falling behind. And uh, so also a lot of theoreticians trying to discuss that, but I don't know many indexes that will put high, uh, European universities higher than American. Um, so it is more and more difficult to sustain uh, the system of social distribution, a high social distribution, as Prince said, that, uh, the, for a long time. So this, at, at one point, the, 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 the predominance of uh, talking to ourselves that we live happier life, it will be even more difficult to prove because we won't have the money to do it, but we have more as princess polarization, conflicts, and we'll be just dipping. Uh, so this is uh, how to, uh, this is uh, the danger that we are on a slippery slide over there. Uh, so th my question <coughs> would be here that uh, at what point the government should be able to take a stand and look for new solutions? Let's, if we agree that um, uh, the predominant views in Europe at least is that we sh need the more state, less private, uh, is there any third solution? combination of solutions for Europe 
to get out of this mess and uh, all the problems. Uh, after this uh, two questions, I'll also entertain some questions. If anybody would like to ask a question, uh, please think about it, and then we'll go back. I don't know the reason of, of, of this sound. Even when I'm not talking, it's there. <laughs> um, okay, so the way it, we agree that there is an increasing tendency to view government as a solution. I think we can all agree on that. But I don't think we, we can agree that there is a predominant view that this is a majoritarian view in Europe that government is a solution. I'm not sure. Just uh, within the next uh, days, I think we will see uh, uh, an important report prepared by the commission chaired by Mario Draghi about how to tackle the competitiveness problem of Europe. There are some first uh, drafts which were published, uh, or uh, at least parts of the report. and. To me, it's not clear that the, the solution is for that, that the, the majorita majority view is that the state is a solution. I think Europe is looking for market solutions. It is looking for market solutions. So what Draghi says is that we certainly need, certainly need more competitiveness, uh, uh, less regulated markets, uh, better uh, capital markets. That, that, that is what Europe lacks, like a well-functioning capital market. That is what differentiates Europe from United States, where you have a lot of innovations because of the financing coming from the capital market. You don't have that in Europe, so the idea is to, to grow it, to develop it. But at the same time, you have a lot of solutions that are behind the uh, simple division state or not state. Like in Europe, there is a clear problem with, with coordination of macroeconomic policy. So today, what is the problem of European growth today? To me, it is too much fiscal consolidation in Germany. So we had a huge energy crisis, and what German government did is it cut the deficit. So companies which were eager to invest in new energy sources, in energy inefficiencies, withdrawn some of the investments because of increased fiscal uncertainty. So that was a mistake. But it's not a mistake of too much or too little government involvement. It is a mistake of bad macroeconomic management. Right, so sometimes it's it's not the the question about whether more or less of the state is important, but in general, I think we Europe Europe is well aware that it needs a well-functioning private market, and most politicians are aware of that. But it's you know in a continent where you have 27, like in an organization where you have 27 countries, and different views, different ideas, it's very difficult to coordinate. Now. I'm, I'm looking for some other ways and types of thinking. I'm really not convinced that more integration is a solution for Europe. Part of the solution might be to give back some competence to the state. The petition that you uh, read at the beginning mentions regional sovereignty. I disagree with the concept of regional sovereignty. What is regional sovereignty? Regions do not have sovereignty. But I agree, I agree with the general direction that we should give more competence to people who decide on the country level. Maybe that's, that's one of the, I would say, ways to find uh, new concepts. Just one point, uh, the, I never heard the European Union saying that we need more regulations. I always hear, hear that we need more uh, competition and less bureaucracy. And since 96, every year we have a new program to increase uh, com uh, competitiveness and uh, lower bureaucracy. And uh, just to remind you, Lisbon agenda and the whole concept that was that in 2001st already. So it is a certain mantra uh, the EU is using for pretty much hiding their regulation uh, style, but it's just uh, on the side. Well, I, I think or one thing which would help, and, and you, you touched it, would be to have more subsidiarity more competences again put and more responsibilities put on the uh, on, on on the different uh, 
uh, members and the different regions. I think that that would help. It could also have a certain positive competition because harmonization is not always the uh, is not always uh, the, the solution because it it can be harmonized not on the right criteria. So a bit also of regulatory competition could be uh, could be good. We should also not put all the blame to the European Union, because actually the European Union does just what the member states want, or what they believe that, that they want. And, but uh, I think a lot more uh, subsidiarity would help, because it would also bring the responsibility much closer to the economy and to the people. Mm, when, when you're sitting in Brussels, you're very far away from, 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 from what is happening. If you are sitting in, uh, in a smaller country right there, you have much, uh, much more direct contact with, with, with the people. So I think that would help. And um, <coughs> yes, and I think that the mantra that one can believe that one can have competitions through regulation, I think is quite wrong. So if there's any question, yes, please, you're the first. Uh, very interesting conversation. Thank you. A lot of great points. I have a question to Mr. Uh, Ignacy Moravsky. Uh, and the question is about repolonization, uh, this concept counter to privatization that uh, previous Polish government of law and justice ac um, basically employed here in Poland. Uh, nationalization, patriotic law. Do you agree with, with this concept? And if not, would you advise the current government to reverse this act of colonization taken by law and justice? Well, first we should remember that the concept of repolonization was introduced not by law and justice, but by the previous government, uh, the uh, civic platform. And one of the key figures uh, who introduced the concept of repolonizing banks was uh, Stefan Kawalec, so one of the architects of economic transformation in Poland, uh, clearly a liberal person. So the idea was not that we should control, like this, the idea was not about state versus private. The idea was about uh, local versus global control. And it was, it, it, it was the, the initial problem was centered in banks. So what uh, we observed in Poland was that during the financial crisis in, in the West, global banks contracted credit activity in Poland, even though there was no reason to do that because the economy grew and performed maybe not very well, but not, not bad compared to the Western uh, Europe or United States. So the idea was that uh, too much foreign control over the banking sector creates risks for the local economy. And in general, I agree with that idea. Then in practice, the problem was that repolonizing meant actually uh, bringing under state authority, because you don't have a lot of private capital in Poland. And then I remember the, the authors of the concept of repolonization when it did happen under the law and justice. So those liberal, liberals that brought the idea of repolonization complained that they did not mean state, of, state control, they did not mean political control. So I'm saying this to, to remind how the, how the idea was initialized. And in general, let's, let's answer the more uh, direct and practical question. Should we reverse, uh, should we privatize banks again? Should we sell, let's say, two PKO banks and I don't know, maybe some other uh, smaller uh, uh, state banks? My answer would be no, because we will face the same problem as I mentioned. Like foreign control over the banks will impose risks when there are some global uh, financial crises. Now, is there a risk associated with uh, state control over the banks? Certainly, yes. 
But I'm, I'm not seeing any signs that this risk creates any inefficiencies today. If you, I, I would give you an, an opposite example to the Polish banking system, the Italian banking system. It is mostly private, but they have the problem of political inference, not from the government, maybe also, but not necessarily from the, from the central government, but inference from local interests or various local inter entrepreneurs, foundations, which, you know, this family control over banks and institutions. So, so it is an example of the economy that can be privately controlled, but still inefficient because of, uh, I would say, uh, 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 conflicting local interests of various entrepreneurs. So in general, my, my answer would be no. We should not reverse the process when it comes to banks because this is the, the sector where, where it all started. Chris, would you like to a few words about private uh, banking against uh, state-owned banking? Well, I'm... <laughs> For me, this is a different uh, kind of thing. I'm also not a banker, but I ob ob observe uh, the, uh, the way. We have some of the... Now, when you talk private bank, you mean private o old bank, not the, the business of private banking. Uh, pri uh, pri well, there are the large ones who are public quoted, like UBS or mm, some, and there are banks with uh, state involvement. I would say that difference is not so big because for uh, two reasons. The bank is part of the infrastructure. So it's a highly, highly regulated uh, business. So the, they are highly su supervised by the financial services authorities. They can only uh, appoint their top management with the um, consent of the financial services authorities. So I don't think it makes now a big difference if the large banks are privately owned or, or not. And most of the business, I don't know the details here, here in Poland, but of banking business are quite large banks around the, the lending. The, um, it's large banks. The smaller banks are the more sort of what is called real private banking, do, uh, doing the, the private banking. So I, I don't think that the difference is now very big. And I don't want to qualify now whether that's good or bad. I know they need to be regulated because the, we, we need it. It's an infrastructure like electricity or the roads, etc. So we, we, we need this uh, basis. There is a discussion with the state-owned banks is on the liability of the state. But we have seen now also uh, on this, uh, with this too big to fail question, that if, if a so-called private bank is in troubles, the, uh, the state might intervene. Thank you so much. One more short question. I just add to this one uh, that, uh, again, comparing European over-regulated banking system and American and the uh, portfolio and value of the American finances comparing to European is also sort of an answer to the question. I mean, they're much larger, much more uh, aggressive, and uh, much more profitable than European. Yes, please. Krzysztof Moszyński, Thriving Individuals Foundation. I'd like to ask uh, both speakers about uh, about the degree to which uh, you think uh, the current EU is over-regulated and centralized, over-centralized, and if it continues especially, uh, at which point would it be, in your opinions, reasonable at least for some countries to start leaving the EU? For example, on a scale from 0 to 10, where 0 means we should definitely stay, everyone should definitely stay, and 10 would mean everyone should leave as soon as possible. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I'm at 0. <laughs> I'm at 0. I mean, e EU is certainly full of 
inefficiencies. But as I, as I mentioned the concept of the second best solution. In the real world, you never have first best solutions, like the solutions that you imagine in an optimal model, where everything is allocated perfectly, efficiently. Uh, so Europe with integration, with, with some degree of political integration, is certainly better than Europe without. And then in practice, in practice, if you look at the performance of United Kingdom after leaving the EU, it is rather poor. So I don't know if they achieved anything by leaving, apart from some political maybe confidence, I don't know. But in, in, in pure, purely economic terms, they gained nothing, maybe even lost. Okay, I, I don't think that um, we are at a stage where I would think we should go from zero to one. So I'm still also on, the, on, on zero because it's not, it's not going to help. I think what we should rather do, we, we need, well, I'm coming from a country which is not a member of the EU, but we are a member of the, of the internal market, which is the European economic area. And uh, for us, it makes no sense to join the political union because we wouldn't have a commissioner, etc. so we wouldn't have a voice. But we have the benefits of the single market, which is good for us. It means we have to take over regulations because, but we would have to take them anyway because we want to trade with the European Union. So, and it's good. And I think it should be, the emphasis should be rather on the point, what can we do to make not only the EU, but also our own countries more efficient? Can we now one more short question? Uh, yes, let's try. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jakub Stanek. I'm a private citizen for the most part. I have a question. Traditionally, we think, just as you gentlemen have been, have been discussing, we have the state control, we have private business. But um, I think there's a hole in that, in that thinking. I was wondering what, uh, what your thoughts on that. We're really big economic actors, state, I mean, global corporations. Do they count as private business? Because we certainly throw them onto the pile of private business. Are they? They have political influence. Elon Musk was able to grant Ukraine internet access in the early days of the Russian invasion. Those are potential political actors. Should we, should we not adjust our thinking with respect to that kind of phenomenon? Yes, very, very good question. Uh, I already mentioned uh, that issue before. I said when, when, when Th Thomas asked whether uh, uh, state-owned enterprises are not too much politicized. I said that you know large corporations are also involved in politics. So I agree. That's the first point. The second point I mentioned at the beginning, Schumpeter. So for Schumpeter, private enterprise is a an enterprise controlled by an individual or a family, right? Close relatives, people who who form a small group, who decide together, who take responsibility. For him, the sp the spread shareholdership in large corporations is not a private enterprise in, in any meaningful way. So for him, there is no huge difference between the enterprise that is all, a huge corporation, which is like a bureaucracy owned by uh, 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 various shareholders and some state ownership. So, so I agree that maybe this, the, 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 the clear division, state owned, privately owned, you know, there is a, a continuum of, of various types of organizations. Uh, well, I think it's um, uh, partially uh, right, but I think the, uh, the advantage still is from, let's say, large corporations, even owned privately, there is not a direct state involvement in when, when you appoint the management, well, when, when, when you, uh, when you uh, give people. I think this is a certain advantage. Also, uh, politics plays also in there uh, quite a big role already. So uh, the, the, I don't know what is the margin of the difference. Just, uh, I just, just one point that also in the, with private companies and private corporations, we may have a change. Uh, Elon Musk took over Twitter for 
probably partially political reasons and change uh, the way they operate it. Someone else will buy it from Musk maybe sooner than later and also change. With a state owned it's much more difficult to make a takeover and uh, change uh, politics of uh, state-owned corporations and private. I want to thank everybody. Thank you for my panel, my panelists. Thank you. We just, I think, extended our time, but thank you so much. Thank you for questions as well. Dear guests, as of now, we would like to offer you to have a 20 minutes break outside of the aula. Some nice coffee break is waiting for you. And uh, see you in 20 minutes, just exactly in 6.35. And then we're going to talk about the artificial intelligence. So get your brain really hungry.
guests. Thanks a lot for accepting the change in the program. Uh, welcome back after the break, which hopefully was nice. It was organized by our university. As of today, as of now, we are going to be speaking about the artificial intelligence, whether we should allow it to be developed freely or regulate. And uh, for such, uh, let's say, hot debate as we have of today, we have, I think, amazing guests that will show you to different perspectives and make you think. So today with us, we have a lawyer. So this person maybe knows something about the regulations and is going to make it hit up. Florin Roman, coming to us today from Romania. And we also have Professor Vojtisov Duk, who is a specialist in not only artificial intelligence, who's actually science of scientists of neuroscience. So knowing the depth of the final impact that such new technology is going to have on us. My name is Julia Metalnikova. I'm the leader of the Student Association for Ukraine's Recovery at our university. So today, on the behalf of my alma mater, I would like to warmly welcome you in our public institution, which has a problem with the microphones. I'm deeply sorry for that. The guy responsible for it just left at say, 5 p.m. and doesn't take the calls. So this is a case study, right? Uh, coming back to our first, first debate. So let me please just take a seat. Thanks a lot. Artificial intelligence all around. OK, this place looks to be cursed. I'm sorry. Um, we have it all around. It boosts competitiveness. It boosts our efficiency and effectiveness. We might think that we spend less time. Creators have great time having ChatGPT helping them to write text. I assume that some of you have used at least today ChatGPT to help you to write an email, at least I have. As a young generation, we rely on AI. I'm now working on my master's thesis, and I use it all just to fix my writing. I rely on Grammarly AI to fix my writing. Even though my mother had to pay for my studies in London, I still have to rely on ChatGPT to fix my English. And I would like to refer to what you have done over here about the impact that such an extensive use of AI in our professional lives is going to have on the way we study, we work, and we communicate. Well, that is a question for psychologists or sociologists <laughs> who are going to study what will happen. But as you know, uh, we have no clue what technology will do to us, and uh, there are some good reasons to worry about that. Uh, nobody thought what will happen when the games were introduced, and now we have the grandchildren and children who are just clicking, 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 and spending half of the life just clicking. Now, uh, it's not very productive, and I see that uh, with the students every year, that it's not just AI, but it's lots of other things like social media and uh, the games that have damaged the brains of the kids. Now, uh, with AI, it may have a very good, uh, well, influence on people who know how to use it. But unfortunately, most people don't know how to use it, and they're just going to, you know, produce, well, we've just been talking uh, a moment ago, there is a new software which can compose song in any style, including, you know, Polish, uh, uh, well, disco polo, whatever you want to, or, you know, uh, uh, songs that have been sung uh, uh, between the war times, uh, very nice voices, and it's almost perfect. And uh, that is something that happens two weeks ago. And there's now at least five companies that do this kind of software. And that happened before with the images, as you know. There are all this generative AI that is generating images, and that even before that happened with the text, of course. So pretty soon, everything will be done better than humans are able to do this. And uh, some people are very much worried. I just, just read uh, a letter by a fellow whose, na whose name is uh, um, Nick, uh, uh, what's his last name, Nick Cave? Yeah, Nick Cave, who wrote a very nice book called The Shallows, about how shallow we be become because of all these technologies, how shallow is our thinking. And he wrote that, that well, uh, we have to defend our humanity because AI is going to steal our souls. It's a very powerful letter saying, okay, we're going to give the creative uh, side of what we've been doing uh, just to machines. And he starts this story saying, well, when you look at the Bible, 
story of how the world was created, you see that God has worked six days and then rested and admired his work. Now, we're going to produce one song after another, one image after another, one text after another, without even having time to appreciate that. And that is something that we should be worried about. <laughs> Um, dear Florin Roman, here I would like to ask you, do you think that the AI is the real threat that we have to regulate right now as soon as possible, or should we see how this technology is being developed and let it just develop the way it's be? Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. <laughs> nice, nice to be here in, uh, in Warsaw. It's my very first time, and I'm <laughs> a little bit uh, anxious. Um, um, thank you, thank you for having me here. I'm I'm proud to stand uh, here in uh, next to to Professor <laughs> Dutch, uh, a huge a huge name uh, um, in this uh, in this field. Um, Unlike uh, the professor, I'm, as, I, as you said, I'm just a lawyer, <laughs> just a lawyer, uh, preoccupied uh, by by this uh, this madness, uh, preoccupied by the way in which uh, this AI thing uh, start to influence uh, my 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 work and uh, uh, at the office, at the at the university. So um, the question is uh, to 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 regulate or not this this field. Uh, I'm I'm uh, definitely for for regulating the field. Why? Uh, why? Uh, for me, it's obvious why because uh, uh, are very many many threats that uh, that are 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 connected with uh, this uh, this uh, this phenomenon. There are uh, there are threats. Um, um, the AI system can be um, can be used uh, to harm people. So we have to regulate to to prevent uh, this misuse of of it. Um, we have to regulate uh, this uh, this uh, this thing because uh, we we saw that uh, we uh, there's uh, there's a danger for the jobs and uh, uh, um, uh, as uh, AI has this uh, great uh, this fight um, to automate to automate. Uh, Okay. <laughs> so, oh. as I said, uh, the, the AI has this great potential to to automate um, um, a vast number of jobs. Uh, so um, we have to regulate it to to assure the the transition of the workforce. Um, uh, then uh, is um, the necessity to. Um, to ensure trans uh, transparency and um, to align uh, with uh, ethical and um, and social norms, um, of course um, th there is uh, problems uh, with um, with um, data data privacy and security. Uh, and um, at the same level, uh, problems with um, with um, uh, the monopolization of the of this field by the um, the huge companies. For all of this, uh, for uh, we have we have to regulate. Um, uh, in the or maybe. The, the the most important thing is uh, that we have to have a legal and um, a moral responsibility a liability for uh, for this uh, this phenomenon because as ai starts to affect uh, our lives uh, is uh, we have to have someone 
who, uh, who is uh, um, liable for uh, uh, for the um, uh, the things that uh, AI uh, is is uh, is doing uh, wrong. So. Um, yeah, for all these reasons, I think uh, we surely need to, to regulate. But uh, the, the question maybe is not uh, whether to regulate uh, or the question it will be how to regulate. Because on the one hand, we have, I don't know, we have, um, yeah, uh, the problem that we don't understand what uh, what AI is uh, really is, um, and the, uh, at the other hand, uh, we have the problem that AI evolves with uh, such a uh, velocity that uh, okay, <laughs> maybe if we start to understand it, uh, AI uh, evolved and okay. So for, for as I said to you, Professor, to, to have good laws, you have to understand the concept. To, to understand the concept, you have to, 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 you have time, you need time. But we have this problem, AI don't have patience. Uh, so uh, AI will be uh, one step ahead of us, uh, of regulating, of uh, Okay, maybe I'll make a comment on, on this too. Uh, anyone has seen the uh, Koyani Katsu? Yeah, so you know this is the world out of balance and it comes from the Hopi Indian word and uh, this is wonderful movie with the music of Philip Glass and you can see how the world went out of balance and this is an old movie, only 30, 40 years ago. We already went out of balance at that time. Things are changing too fast as you say and uh, Unfortunately, this is going to accelerate very much uh, and we don't know where we'll end up with. Uh, but uh, just to you know, focus on regulations, uh, I have been involved a bit in writing recommendations for the regulation for the AI Act, which has just been announced uh, recently. And uh, uh, one problem was that, that initially they wanted to regulate everything. Of course, we regulate everything, all food, all you know, clothing, uh, I mean, the glue that has to smell, uh, I mean, toys for children. And, and it's very good because we have to you know, worry about the potential harmful effect of everything. Uh, and uh, we don't regulate software, though, uh, which was very strange, right? Uh, if you use Microsoft, you just have to sign, OK, it's not responsible for any damage that it will do to my files or whatever I do, right? And, and software was never regulated and was developing very quickly. So some people worry that now with these regulations we're going to have a problem because China and uh, US are going to be very much ahead of what we can use just because of these regulations. And one reason uh, that, that uh, we should worry about regulations uh, is that, uh, well, you have to define what artificial intelligence is about. It's not just a program that will bring some results. It's a program that solves problems for which we don't have effective algorithms, which simply means that if we just cannot uh, formulate uh, some kind of rules or a program that is going to end up with the results that we want to achieve at the end, like the, uh, you know, uh, any kind of accounting program, whatever we do, okay, the program knows how to compute things. So, so the first AI was the, well, calculator. The calculator could, you know, take uh, a, a square root or some power uh, very quickly uh, and we just had to work maybe um, well, 10 or 20 minutes to, to do that by hand, right? Even if we knew the, the algorithm. But it was very quick. And then more and more things got, uh, well, automatized. And finally, we came to the, to the point where we can solve problems which we could not formulate. For example, a problem how to generate images. Nobody knows how to generate images, right? We just cannot write an algorithm saying, okay, generate a, 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 a nice cat. No way. But we have learned how to create systems that actually internalize the 
knowledge about the world and can express that. And this system is basically something that we have in our heads, right? In our brains, we internalize the world. Why can we do this? Because we have 100 billion of neurons in the brain and 100,000 billion connections. This actually, today, there is the conference called uh, the uh, Polish Alliance for uh, Development of Artificial Intelligence uh, in uh, the Technical University. Today, actually, uh, the first plenary lecture was about scaling, uh, when uh, we've seen how bigger scale means that certain things that could not be done are now done quite efficiently. Uh, and that is about the generation of, of images, for example, right? So AI is about solving problems for which we don't have the algorithm. And what happens? Well, European Union comes up uh, in the AI regulations with the definition which says system AI is a system which is designed to work on different levels of autonomy and it can show the uh, uh, ability to adapt uh, and uh, for, uh, can draw conclusions for uh, uh, different cases and can uh, uh, actually make inferences based on the input data and can generate the output data. And if you think about that, that means that the uh, well thermostat, for example, is a system like that. It's an AI system. It just does things for us. It knows that it's too hot, and it just switches itself off. I mean, there will be lots of confusion because this kind of definition, which is not a simple definition that we, uh, or at least I try to promote that in the computer science circle, uh, that, that it has to be about solving problems for which we don't have the effective algorithms. Otherwise, it's just simple computing that we had for, for a long time, right? And, and, and unfortunately, there will be lots of systems that now are going to be under the, uh, well, uh, umbrella of this AI act, and people may say, okay, you should not use it because it's an AI and you don't have a spe spe special certificates for that and lots of other things. This may be actually very bad for Europe. So for that reason, I, I, I think some regulations are always useful, but, but we have to be very careful how they should look like. I was in Brussels uh, months ago and talked with one fellow who was involved in this uh, AI Act, uh, uh, a member of uh, European Parliament, and uh, he said that they know that this is outdated at the moment that they have issued that. And before it will come to the power, which will be like two years from now, it will be completely obsolete, right? So, uh, so we, we really cannot catch up, at least lawyers cannot catch up with uh, what is happening with AI. And, and I can tell you later what will really happen, just to scare you for the night. Just. The good thing is that you have underscored that we do not catch up and the lawyers, uh, they spend some time with the scientists who actually explain to them uh, at least some of the foundings that they have, uh, they have found. But AI is about the users. It's not only about the IT guys, right? It's also about just mere people who use some tools in their daily lives. And those people most likely will not be willing to deal with uh, lengthy arrays of the EU regulations. They most likely are not going to go into the scientific papers to such an extent that it will really open to them what they are dealing with. And the question here is, should we focus on regulating and then again, uh, you know, having the clauses like, oh, do you agree for cookies? Yes, I agree because I don't know what it is, but I need to use this page, right? And we have a chance that uh, AI tools are going to become another tool that we're just going to put a K. So is there a question of regulation or education, but not only vocational additional courses, but actually the whole transformation of the education system from primary school, oops, sorry, uh, to higher education? I'd like to pr proceed with Professor over here. Well, uh, uh, let, let me just comment on the bloody cookies, which really is something that European Union has introduced without allowing us to opt off of this. I'm, I'm, I'm not really looking at the pages where I have to worry about, oh, they will know that I have visited them. I know what I'm doing. And at each page I have to, and, and sometimes they're done in such a way that you really have to spend time to really click and get rid of this. And every time I can say no, 
I just say no because this is a page I visited once in my lifetime. Why should I have any cookies about that? And, you know, so, so this was a stupid regulation. I mean, okay, you can regulate things saying, okay, there, there are some pages which are dangerous, but, but you have to kind of evaluate what, what you want to, you know, people uh, uh, to do. And, uh, and I'm just wasting a lot of time because the regulations have been introduced. RODO is like that too. I mean, in many cases, it's just completely obvious that I agree. But, but just, just uh, two days ago, I had to send uh, another three pages uh, through the normal post to Yaginonian University because, because they have produced a form on which I have three times to sign instead of just signing once, which I agree for everything that they want me to. It's, it's just formal agreement, right? So, so, so it's, it's the bureaucracy is doing things that we just have to rebel against. And I do it all the time, I tell you. I just write. To, to, I sent the legal opinions also to uh, our administration and saying, no, that, that's not necessary. I mean, I have a legal opinion that I have the right to sign things on my tablet because then I have this in my... Uh, a tablet on my disk, and then I can send that, and people can print that, and I know I have done that. But if somebody just signs it uh, and pretends it's my signature, and it's not hard to find how it looks like, how can I know that? You know, Picasso was once asked about the uh, uh, authenticity of some uh, image, uh, pictures that, that, that he has done years ago, and he, and he was signing them. He thought, okay, like, they look just, just okay, right? Okay, and maybe sometimes they had the, the, the signs. So, so all, all this is quite dangerous. But of course, I mean, coming back to your question, which is about education. Yes, we have to educate ourselves and have to know how to use it because AI may help us in many different ways. But uh, unfortunately, uh, all people have used so far is just GPT chat because, uh, uh, well, I have, a, I have a nice plot actually, uh, uh, which I just did show yesterday to people in biocybernetics that uh, uh, chat GPT is absolutely dominating. There are a few others, like uh, the kids are, are, are sometimes discussing with character AI. Anyone has a favorite uh, character AI avatar? Uh, character AI allows you to talk to anyone. I mean, like philosophers, like celebrities, like uh, scientists. Uh, uh, I like to uh, talk with uh, uh, Lao Tse, who is a nice uh, Chinese philosopher, uh, because this system has read or has processed all kinds of uh, uh, books and uh, information about these people. And it may be incredibly good because a year ago there was this experiment in which people have fed the uh, system with all the books and articles of a famous philosopher Daniel Dennett. And Daniel Dennett is the best philosopher, he, uh, yes, there are like a dozen books in Polish uh, uh, that he has written. Very, he, he writes very nicely. And so they have asked him 10 questions about philosophy and he wrote his essays and then they have asked the same 10 questions four times to GPT 3.5. And so we had like five different versions and then you give it to the people who are experts on Dennett. So there are professional philosophers and ask them, can you find out uh, which is the original Dennett? And the chance should be, of course, 100%. But in fact, the philosophers just got it right 50%. And if you give it to any of you, the chance is 24%, so absolutely random. Okay, so that means that GPT 3.5 can write at the level of the best human philosopher, which is just amazing, right? Okay, but we are now in the situations in which students write using GPT, like you said, and then we think about really evaluating results of this in an automatic way so that uh, another AI system is going to evaluate that. And we'll just relax and forget about all this, okay? This will be between AI and an AI. Now, that is not a good direction. Uh, so, so, so when people say, okay, how, how do we stop students or what should we do with students? I say it's very simple. We just finally have to talk with them and find out whether they understand what, <laughs> what they have written. And if they don't understand that, well, they haven't learned anything, right? They must have it in their head, not just because they have produced it. <laughs> but but uh, in general, it's a very difficult question how to... Um, 
educate people. We think about really having a program uh, for uh, educating everybody at the university. But how to do it? There are just a few of us who know <laughs> something about AI, and the university has several thousand people, uh, and so it's not that easy. There are all kinds of courses that you can find, but they're like more business-oriented and uh, don't go too far. And what we see now is just the tip of an iceberg. You have to see how quickly things have changed and have to imagine how they will change in the next two years. And uh, things that are coming, it's like with the music, uh, as I said, uh, are, are really incredible. It's not just this kind of associative uh, systems like ChatGPT, but it's uh, much more complex agents that are going to do a lot of things for you. So uh, we've been talking about large language models, now we're talking about large action models, things that are going to run your life for you. <laughs> so there are different ideas. Okay, maybe we just should prepare for becoming a Skansen and just relax. <laughs> Florin, how do you see this combination of making the regulations, let's say, workable, knowing that people don't read them? making the regulation eventually vulnerable to individual breaches yeah, on the individual level? Uh, I think that um, regulations, as I said, are crucial uh, for uh, setting legal, legal um, standards. But at the same time, education plays a key role um, in empowering users to, to really understand and use AI. Uh, in these circumstances, I think uh, uh, education must evolve at, at, uh, at, at all levels and um, uh, ensuring the individuals have the, the proper skill to, 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 to deal with, uh, with this, this, this thing. Um, uh, at uh, EU level, I think uh, Regulation should be complemented by uh, by uh, educational initiatives mm -hmm. that uh, demystify AI and uh, promote uh, digital uh, literacy. Um, but education should not only focus um, on how to use, uh, as you said, uh, but also uh, on on understanding what really means uh, EI and uh, education should be uh, about building that critical um, thinking necessary to 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 uh, to evaluate to uh, evaluate the content and the decision that EI uh, uh, generate. Um, Therefore, uh, while regulation is, uh, as I said, uh, essential in, um, for managing the, the, um, the development of AI, um, education is uh, the key of, uh, uh, to empowering uh, individuals uh, to use AI wi wisely and um, ethically. Let, let, let me say uh, still a few words about education. We did not have uh, any large language models in Poland because, as you have heard, some of these models cost tens of millions or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, unfortunately. That's why OpenAI is hiring uh, nuclear physicists. They want to have a nuclear power plant to, <laughs> to actually get the electricity for the very large systems. And they're just talking about the uh, Stargate system, which will be $100 billion, uh, and which will really require a separate uh, nuclear power plant to uh, support that. So that's one direction, uh, to create very, very big models that will be uh, well, omniscient somehow, uh, which is of course not realistic. The other direction is that we can have smaller models which already have been trained by other people and they're open 
uh, software. So we have the um, parameters, we can retrain them, and it's not that costly. And there are many families of models, like, uh, for example, LAMAS models, which are going to be implemented in Poland. There are, there are two large projects, one is in uh, Wrocław, the other in Gdańsk. The, 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 the one in Gdańsk is called PLUM, or PLUM, uh, because this is based on LAMA, uh, the one in Wrocław also. And uh, we're, we're just going to discuss uh, uh, these projects at, at the conference that's going on now at uh, Technical University. But uh, we hope that these are much smaller projects that are, will be specialized and uh, especially specialized for Polish language. And they're going to be helpful in very specific domains, uh, which still have to be defined. So at one point, we have something called the uh, Polish Union of Education. And then we, we just had last year also this uh, uh, Polish uh, conference on AI. And I propose that we should you know, um, uh, ask the government to create an educational program, uh, because they, are they, they want to spend 1 billion, uh, 400 millions on computers for kids in the fourth grade. What good does it do? Okay, kids have computers, what do they do with the computers? Well, we know what they do with the computers. That's not what we want them to do. So if we don't give them a proper environment in which they can use them in a sensible way, this is going to be wasted money. So I, I told my colleagues, okay, let's just ask for 10% of this, which will be 140 millions. Well, with this amount of money, we really could do a lot as, a, as a, you know, people working on, on AI at uh, different schools and universities. Uh, that never happened. Um, now, there is also Polish Union of Education, which, uh, well, has, uh, uh, lots of rectors from different private and public schools also, uh, which has been formed uh, a few months ago. And, and also I've tried to press them actually to, uh, well, uh, appeal to the government to introduce a large-scale educational program like this. I don't know if it will be successful. Today we were hoping that one of the uh, deputy ministers is going to come to open our conference because it's very close. It's just, you know, a few steps from the ministry. Uh, they don't have time, unfortunately, right? Because there are more important things, maybe a European election, whatever. So I, I'm not very positive about how things will develop in, in our country because I see what happens in Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> in, in many other countries where people really invest in that. Even in Moscow, there is, uh, there is AI University since uh, already a like, couple years or so, right? And we're just, just left nowhere because there is no money for this. Well, you, you know that European Union is spending half of the uh, budget uh, uh, on, on the farmers. And uh, right now, the uh, chance to get European grant is about 4%. So it's a complete lottery, right? So science doesn't matter. We, we should prepare to become Wisconsin, I think. That, that would be the best solution. <laughs> and uh, I would like to quickly summarize uh, here that uh, First of all, on a very optimistic note uh, from Florin that AI empowers. We just have to know how to use it. And for this, we need incentives and programs, huge programs that target not only the development of technology, but first of all, the users that use it. Learn, be inspired, don't be afraid to test, and be welcome for the next panel that will be moderated by Marek. Uh, for, for, for those interested in the single market, please uh, don't leave the room. We'll start immediately in two minutes. Uh, there is uh, no longer coffee break outside. So, uh, uh, be Uh, so we, we, are, we are waiting for uh, Prince uh, Michel, uh, who will be speaking again, uh, and he will be here in five minutes. So uh, uh, please, please return in five minutes.
Jeden, jeden. Wydaje mi się, że ten nie sprzęży. Widzisz, który lepiej? Wydaje mi się, że ten, którego wyłączyłem. Czy mamy 45 stopni, to by było... No tak, ale i tak trzeszczało. A teraz zostawmy jeden mikrofon w takim razie, bo wydaje mi się, że to ten trzeszczy. To nie jest wina kabelku, bo wystrzewodowo kolego. Ale to tutaj nie ma jakiegoś odbiornika. Jest, tylko że nie mamy do niego dostępu. Sorry for a slight delay. The Prince Michel is giving interview upstairs, but I think he should be downstairs in two minutes. So I think we are ready to start. I will just ask the people from outside. Yes, I think you can already have a seat. That's that's fine.
now we have only one microphone, the one that is working the best. I learned, also, I, I, I already learned that there were problems with microphones in the first session. As you uh, know, unfortunately, the guy who is responsible for technical issues went home at 5 o'clock in the public university. So no, no technicians. Uh, you, you cannot do events at uh, public schools uh, after uh, 5. But uh, uh, in this last session, we will change the topic completely and speak about uh, something very important for, I think, Polish economy, but European economy as well, that is the single market of the European Union. In the upcoming uh, two weeks, we will celebrate 20th anniversary of uh, Poland uh, in the European Union and many other countries from Central and Eastern Europe. And we recently had 30th anniversary of the single market uh, in Europe. Uh, today with me, we have uh, one speaker that you already met in first session, uh, Prince uh, Michel of Liechtenstein, who is uh, expert on geopolitics, on international economics, and who will uh, uh, give us his thoughts on, on the single market and also will discuss the future of the single market. Market. And uh, Maciej Bukowski, economist, uh, president of uh, Visa Europa, Wise Europe, uh, think tank in Warsaw. Uh, so I will start with uh, uh, Maciej and Polish context, but also European context. Let's start with benefits and, and emphasizing the importance of the single market. So my question is, what are, in your view, the, the biggest benefits of the single market? And can we say that the single market is the most important project of the European Union that, that we have, that we feel as consumers, as people in, in Poland and the whole Europe? Uh, well, when looking back to the beginning of the EU, rather it was still, you know, concentrated on steel and coal at the time in the 1950s, we can understand easily that the, the project was of course designed in order to overcome, and it was the mood of the time to overcome animosities between Western European nations and to start again, yes, to come back to the idea that will bring peaceful Europe. But on the other hand, it was also driven by technology of the time, yes, that uh, Europe was after, let's say, 50 years of very bad economic growth, yes, bad because it was uh, it was covered, you know, this period by two major wars which killed many millions of Europeans, by Great Depression, which was not nice economically worldwide, especially in the developed nations, yes, like United States and Europe, and basically economic growth was very slow. At the same time, when looking at the United States, it, was, it looked a little bit better. Of course, Great Depression was there, and involvement of the United States in both wars was there, yes, but actually the impact of, of the, these wars on U.S. economy was minor, or e and if anything, positive. Yes, and it, uh, they managed at the time to scale up technologies that had been brought by the, the Second Industrial Revolution of 1870 onwards. Uh, uh, so, ba namely, widespread mechanization, widespread energy use, yes, of electricity, steam power before that, and uh, and combustion engine, and this allowed basically United States to grow, grow much better than Europe in the first 50 years of the of the 20th century, despite Great Depression. Uh, and, this te and they developed many technologies, technologies that were very suited to the large market of the United States. Yes? They scaled them up, like Henry Ford. This is probably the best known example, but basically in every industry you can see this. Yes? So building large, complex factories that can produce, must produce many different goods. Yes? This is the time when still the industry is the major sector of the economy, yes? employing 40-something percent of the, of, the, of the adult population. And then... Europe is much more fragmented yes, after, afterwards. Yes? We, we see smaller markets of Germany, of England, yes, or United Kingdom, of France, of Spain, etc., yes, and Italy. This is devastated by war, other cases, but th th this is fragmented Europe. And you basically cannot scale up those technologies on those isolated island markets. Yes? You need common market. And this is the, this economic driver of 
unification of Europe, yes, this, this, because it was much better suit, suited to the new conditions. Of course, basically, initially, to steel and coal and, and, and similar, similar sectors. Yes, but very quickly, Europeans realized that this is good for the economy if you can produce cars in Germany and then sell them to French. Yes, or to the French or to, to, to Italians, and opposite, yes, and everybody wanted to sell on much larger market, and this was driving the unification of, uh, of European economic community at the time, and eventually it was, let's say, filled in with other ideas, and uh, which formed eventually the European Union. And therefore, somehow, the raison d'etre, yes, of, of Europe is to, to, to unify and to be larger and larger and larger to expand, yes, because then this expands also the market, economically speaking, yes, not only the might of Europe uh, worldwide, yes, geopolitically, but also uh, 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 the market, yes, and even if you look on the, this is maybe the last case of the, this expansion of 20, 20 years ago, yes, for the Central European states, and, and then you can see basically the same idea, and those of the Western nations that managed to uh, understand very quickly that this is an opportunity, yes, this is an opening of the new markets, new labor force, yes, you can make things cheaply, but also you, you have access to much larger pool of consumers, they, they won, yes, so namely the Germans, yes, but the Germans, Austrian, and, and the others, yes, basically not Northwestern Europeans, whereas those that were more remotely suited and also served, uh, you know, similar, maybe played a similar role in the former European Union, so with more southern nations, they struggled over the last 20 years, yes, they didn't manage to fit into the new, new this new expansion and this new phase of expansion of the, of the EU. Now it's probably changing after adjusting of wages and other macroeconomic factors. But still, you can see that this unified market benefits those that understand that how to utilize it, yes? And we probably, in Europe, we don't understand it fully, yes? So there are still island markets, yes, to, and especially in services. But for the industry, it is, my, so it is already factory Europe. I can say, yes, which, which is unified market on both on the supply and uh, demand side. Thank you. It seems that we solved the problem with the microphone, uh, so that's good for you as the listeners. Uh, the same question to, uh, to, to, to Prims uh, Michel. Uh, what do you think about the biggest benefits uh, of, of the single market for, for Europe? Do you think there are countries or areas, sectors that benefit more or other or less, and, and also do you agree that this is the most important, you know, political part, political pillar of the European integration? Well, I think it's certainly the most important economic um, achievement of, of this. I think one can't really uh, divide political from economic, because we could say also through this economic way, we achieve that all these tensions, like between Germany and France, etc., all this, we, uh, we, we created also a, Euro, a certain European spirit. So I think this is, uh, this is there and this is a, a, a big achievement. And it f it's formulated, let's say, in the interior market. In theory, everybody should, 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 should be in then at certain stages it was said, well, certain countries profited more because they, they, they could better sell or not. There were also certain problems when, let's say, the markets opened and there were more, de uh, more developed economies and less developed economies. For instance, if we look at the case of Spain, when, when they joined, they had at the same time to take over the acquis communautaire, all, all, all the regulations, and open the market fully for products from France, from Germany, etc., who had already a much more productive and also adapted to the standards I industry. In Spain, it brought huge benefits for concerning the infrastructure, etc., but it ruined also quite a number of the local businesses and Spain got very much sort of more unilateral in the construction industry. 
So this was also then a damage. But with the time that um, uh, eloquent. So actually, I would say basically everybody will finally, on the long term, is, is, is winning. Now, there are different sectors where we are wrong. Let's say when we look at the goods and manufacturing, they, for, for them, it's certainly good. Where we are still lacking the way of really creating a good market is in the services industry. And I think there we could still make a, a, a quite, quite a lot of progress. Thank you, and uh, uh, I think you started the, the the second topic that I would like to to cover. That is, uh, uh, what are the, the the biggest barriers, but maybe also why we have these barriers. You know, sometimes the the periods of crisis of pandemic we experience this are are good times for protectionists, and we observe also this intra-EU protectionism that is uh, happening in, in many parts of, of Europe. Uh, so I would like to, to, to ask you what are, in, in your views, the, the biggest challenges regarding the barriers and why, you know, after 30 years, uh, uh, what, we, uh, what was recently said in the opinion poll of, of, of uh, uh, European entrepreneurs was that many barriers that are mentioned now as problems were present in Europe 20 years ago. So why these barriers are still so strong? Uh, are there strong interest groups, lobbying that is blocking this, these barriers, and in which areas we, we observe them the most? Of course, when looking on the single the different individual markets, you can observe those kind of bar barriers. This is, to some extent, normal. Yes, we have to remember that there are we are different states, yes, united in the form of European Union, but still different states, yes even more fragmented politically that, let's say, United States, which also have different legislation systems within United States, yes, different individual states. And those states in the United States also have different legal systems, yes. So for instance, they regulate lawyers differently. And if you are in the bar, yes, in one of the states, you are not in the other, yes. So there's, there is a barrier to be a lawyer, yes. You cannot transfer that easily from, from the state to the state. The same is in Europe. We have many different certificates, yes, for professions uh, among different nations, and you have to be certified in order to be, to perform certain pro profession in France or in Luxembourg or in Austria or in Poland. And this is being removed, yes, so the European Commission is working to remove them, but it's not always, not in every sector, it's probably as important, yes, or uh, as easy for the politicians to do this, yes, so, and therefore we have sectors that are very much delayed, yes, so my favorite example may be railways, yes, railways are connecting industry, you can say, it should serve Europe by connecting Europe, but it is not, yes, when you travel with a train from one country to another European country, then the stuff is changing at the border, yes, and, you know, the the, the driver of a train and the other, they are, they are changing, replacing, because they, the other company is taking over. We don't, we are starting to have something like cheap railway pro providers, yes, or the lines, yes, like we have uh, in, 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 in air traffic, yes, but we don't have it yet in railways, yes, so this is something that should be deregulated, that should be unified, the standards, technical standards and non-technical standards, and to, to make our life easier and cheaper and more accessible to Europeans to get this connectivity, to increase this connectivity, but somehow it's very hard to overcome, yes, and then you don't have, you have these islands, uh, the, the, the mountains between France and, uh, and and Spain are also the mountains for railways, yes, and then you can look on the, uh, but when you look, uh, for instance, on the energy sector, it's much more advanced, yes, so this integration by hard infrastructure, by regulation, is much more advanced than in railways, yes. So maybe one at a time, yes, because the commission, you know, the, the, the officers there, etc., are not that potent. They have limited time to divide their attention, etc., and to, it takes time to, 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 to fight it over. But I believe we, we are making progress, yes, and overall, over time. 
I, I, yes, the same, the same question about the, the barriers, but also the reason why, why we have them. And uh, uh, I would also like to highlight, you know, that uh, there is often discussion that we should have, you know, more harmonization or common regulations to, to, to end these barriers. But maybe it, this is also not the perfect solution for, for, for solving this problem because, you know, if you harmonize some stuff to, you know, let's say minimum wage in Poland to French level or uh, some other regulations in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe to over-regulated uh, standards of uh, Western economics, it may harm some economics more than, than others. What I think, and we touched it already in the, uh, in, in the first panel, I think we, we have to see, uh, really we have to have a probably higher degree of subsidiarity in, 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 in the countries. And on the other hand, we have like the, the railways show, we have a need to, uh, to, to work together. Now the US, they have big, national thing, but they started as, and this comes back to the first thing again, by they were private. They were not uh, state-owned. And I think here there's a problem of a state-owned company because the state-owned ends at the border between Germany and France or, uh, or Poland or the Czech Republic, etc. Et so so th th there are still problems which wouldn't, um, if, if we are in a way to to do that rationally, don't make it. We don't need too much harm harmonization. And I think it's also good if we have a certain regulatory competition between the countries. So if the social systems <coughs> and social systems have to adapt to the economy, and the economies will always be, we don't want a common European economy. <coughs> we want a so, so certain thing, we want a common market, not necessarily a common economy. And one of the strengths which we have to see in Europe is are also the differences be between the countries. And the differences will, will become even better if we have a healthy competition. Not a killing competition, but a healthy competition. And if we have differences in the social systems, I think it is, it is uh, pretty positive because it also avoids that we make a huge, all common European mistake. So there, 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 are, there are choices. So I think harmonization will, uh, will not do it. And I think we should take away barriers. As I said before, we have it very strongly in the service industry. We have seen it on, on the railways. We have seen, we also touched that there's no European capital market, which, which would be important. So there, there are points where we, where we, we sh should go further in Europeanization, but I think there are other points where we should actually go back and having a stronger subsidiarity. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to, 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 to use this opportunity of, of this panel also to, to recommend you the, the report that will be published by the Economic Freedom Foundation about the single market next week, uh, uh, that uh, we would like to use the uh, opportunity of the anniversary of Poland's membership in the EU to, to speak about the, the single market, but also the solutions. And, uh, and regulations is one of the issues that is mentioned here. What is very interesting is that, you know, many regulations are national regulations. These are not uh, European Union regulations. And when you look at different indices of regulations, for example, of services, uh, Poland is one of the uh, countries in the top overly regulated services. So if we would like other countries to open services for, for our people, we should maybe start from ourselves and also deregulate to, to give good example to other Europeans to open their markets. And what is also, I think, important is the new economy, like digital economy. We just had session about the AI. I think both guys were, were kind of pro-regulatory, but we should think why there is situation when from when we have 22 biggest uh, IT or digital corporations, only four are registered or, or developed in Europe, or whether it's a good thing that in the last few years we had 116 uh, acts regulating digital economy in Europe, uh, and European Union is actually 
making you know uh, campaigns that they are first regulating this they are first regulating that uh, this is important question how it will affect digital economy in in Europe but I would like to 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 to, to start my last round with with the question about the future we are 30 years after starting the single market. What, in your view, and I will start with Maciej again, should be the future of the single market? What should be priorities? And also, what should be the openness of the single market? Because single market tries to be very open inside, but we are also in the times of discussion, you know, the protection is on our borders. We don't know what will happen in the United States. We remember previous uh, presidency of Donald Trump when there were there was a wave of protectionism we also have big discussions in Poland and other countries in Central and Eastern Europe about Ukraine the the grain issues the agricultural products so should single market be more open to towards other markets and other economies and how it should develop in the future uh, well it's a very hard question yes uh, my instincts say that probably we should more uh, we should close probably our borders more tightly, especially because of the maybe not so much American competition, but rather Chinese competition, which is not exactly 100% fair. Yes, of course, the world as the whole benefited a lot from globalization uh, over the last 30 years, especially after 2000. Yes, but in general after 1990. And uh, and this should continue, yes, with the other countries joining the, the peloton, yes. So India, South Asia, maybe this is now their time. But at the same time, we, we can see that China uh, has a very aggressive industrial policy, yes. Basically, they spend a lot of money from, let's say, taxpayer money, partially, partially simply printing this money, yes, in the banking sector and providing very cheap loans uh, to, to the industry that allows the Chinese industry that benefited a lot from cooperating with European companies, not exactly fairly always, uh, but still benefiting a lot technologically speaking and uh, in the management uh, practices, etc. Now they are capable of scaling up the production to the volumes that are very hard to compete for Europeans, especially especially in central industries. But we can see it already in EVs, in automotives, but also in, I don't know, windmill power production, yes, so in previously in photovoltaics, etc. And actually, basically, in every industry, when you look in, in, in China, from very traditional, like steel making or cement, so very modern, yes, which is happening right now, like chip making, yes, China is already producing this outdated, a little bit cheap, so not very, this is technological up to the edge, but this, let's say, one generation, two generations back in the volumes larger than Europe. And Europe specialized in this chip making because it was suited for the industries like automotive, yes, we have those chips in our windows, yes, in our cars. And uh, and this might be a problem for Europe, yes, this competition, because this competition is not 100% fair, I would say. Yes? These this companies are heavily subsidized to scale up. And once they scale up, they are abandoned from the sub of the, of the Chinese government. And, uh, um, uh, and let's say this is wild uh, west for them yes who survives then who then survives uh, uh, and the stronger survive in the, this jungle but it means that all they are also very aggressive in terms of pricing because they have already capacities production capacities and they can really lower the price which benefits international consumers not only in europe yes also in, in africa we can say uh, but uh, it might be a problem for European industry and for jobs and for strategic in interests also, yes, because at the end of the day, we don't have this privilege of the United States that we are basically a continent and with only two neighbors that are very friendly and we or cooperate, we cooperate them very closely, yes. We have Russia, yes, we are a tiny peninsula in Asia, we have Africa, close and large migration from there, and we have to be strong, yes? So this fortress Europe somehow probably 
in the future, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't, for instance, integrate more and uh, liberalize more with uh, with North America, let's say, yes, with uh, and, and the other so-called friendly nations like Japan, and we are so doing it, yes, we are signing treaties on, on the free trade with them. So, um, so this is mixed, I believe, uh, answer, my answer must be mixed. Uh, yes, the, the, the same question to, to you about the, the future and the openness uh, and something that I would like to add because you mentioned China uh, and, and other, you know, unfriendly countries in terms of, you know, the, the competition subsidizing their markets, uh, but, uh, but uh, yes, uh, but, but, uh, but uh, uh, there are countries that we are cooperating with in, in NATO, like United States, there was discussion in the past about closer EU-United States relations in trade. So, so what are your thoughts on this type of cooperation? Can we imagine that in, let's say, next 30 years, we can create, expand the single market to, to countries like United Kingdom, Canada, United States, and have like kind of transatlantic single market? Is this the possible future of, of, of the single market? Maybe I think we had, uh, when was it, 10 years ago, we had this discussion about TTIP, to create this big uh, single market with actually Europe and the United States, and the same the United States or the Pacific. Uh, this was this discussion, unfortunately, that failed. It wasn't, it wasn't only uh, President Trump, because TTIP was mainly killed in Europe and not in, in, the, in the US, where the Pacific one was uh, killed by President Trump. But this one had also certain uh, protectionist measures against the rest of the world, which, was, which is not undangerous. I, and, but I think we should have as much free markets as possible, but protect us against strong state interventionism, uh, which is mostly with China. And therefore, let's say, the, uh, the trade war of Trump with China, which was uh, pretty criticized in Europe, made to a big extent made sense. Not, not, not all, and maybe not his style was maybe not the most elegant one, but, uh, but, but, but it made sense. But we have also to see, I think, another the, the, um, problem. We have to see first, I would say something on the internal way. We have now made a very dangerous change. We had before, we said, we have to eliminate tax competition between the countries. And I thought tax competition between the countries was not necessarily bad because it forced governments to control better their budgets. But we widely eliminated. But now we started, actually inside this market, a competition with subsidies. And the biggest sinners are the two largest economies there, Germany and France. So this is a, a, a very dangerous uh, the, the development. The other way is that we are also doing with our protectionism, we are making uh, big, uh, big failures politically. For instance, we need to have, it's for us it's very important to have good relationships with Africa and to develop Africa. And that can only be done with business. What are we doing? We are creating the so-called um, supply chains le legislation in, in Europe, which will greatly make it difficult for European businesses to do, um, uh, to do business in Africa. Not that I want that one doesn't have good standards, but um, many p uh, businesses say now the risk for us is now too big with the supply chain directive uh, to do still, uh, still business in Africa. And this is, ag again, a change thing. And actually, we want to trade with Africa. We want to invest in Africa. But we don't want to have an uncontrolled migration. And the best way to avoid this, uh, the best way to develop this con uh, continent is business. So th 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 there are uh, different ways. I'm a, fr a free marketer. I think the globalization has brought uh, a, a lot of that. And now we are talking about the problems of globalization. And we start now also a fight between the United States and Europe with subsidies. Because the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is actually a big subsidy act. And then the European Union immediately answered 
the green <laughs> economy act, etc. And so, actually, we are we are in 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 the bad trend, which we tr should try to re to reverse internally and externally. Thank you. Uh, we are running out of time. Maybe there is one question that you can have to our guests. Uh, I don't see the question, so oh, no, no question. Okay, uh, and uh, thank you for mentioning this. Uh, this, you know, we can call it competition on you know, subsidies or, or, or state aid that is happening. I think this is really something that should be a discussion topic for the future of globalization and and and, and the single market and transatlantic uh, relations. Uh, so uh, thank you for for joining us for this discussion about this. There is a question, yes. Please, uh, may. Uh, I would like to ask whether, in your opinion, is there any factor of European single market that would not be uh, harmed by this uh, transatlantic uh, relationship between the European Union and the United States? Uh, uh, and the I don't think so, because that's, that's what China uh, harmed. Uh, what does it mean harmed? Yes, because of course, competition sometimes enforces companies to change, yes, and actually to compete, yes, so sometimes it's good. Some sectors are simply protected by natural conditions, you can say, yes, if something is very heavy and low value per kilogram, you don't transport it, basically, yes, so, for instance, steel making is not that much afraid of very scaled up Chinese steel sector, because it's simply too far away to transport every element. However, in Turkey, it's much closer, yes, so, that's uh, this competition, direct competition, yes, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, green regulations in Europe. But uh, but other sectors, yes, they are endangered, as EVs, for instance, yes. Uh, so, uh, but you know, everything, yes. Sometimes it benefits European economy other way, as yes, like cheap PVEs, yes, photovoltaics, and you can install them. But we killed basically our own producers, despite the fact that those technologies have been developed in Europe and the United States, yes? So this is a very hard choice to, 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 to make, yes? But I, be I believe that in general now, especially when China subsidized a lot of industries in huge, with huge money, and uh, uh, at the same time, the, the model of development of Chinese economy is very much skewed to the, um, let's say, to in, onto the investment side, yes? And now the real estate boom, infrastructure boom is over, but they, they try to prolong the economic growth through simply export, export, exporting, yes? And then this is the question when, yes? When they are, with these overcapacities, they can benefit Africa, I would say, yes? Because they, those cheap stuff they can export to Africa, and uh, especially, you know, say, like cheap windmills, cheap providing, for instance, energy, yes, which is one of these uh, problems for Africa to develop. And, uh, and they are perceived very attractive, yes, those cheap Chinese goods. But for European producers, that must, might be a problem, and it is a problem for in many, many branches, yes. You can, like, I don't know, the, 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 the ceramics, yes, ceramics in, uh, for your bathroom, yes, and... Uh, this will cost, I don't know, half a euro in uh, in in China, and then when you go to supermarket in Europe, it will cost you five euro. So that's a difference. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you for for the question for for your answer, Maciej. I think uh, that uh, please remember that in the upcoming days there will be 30th and uh, 20th anniversary of Poland in the EU, and remember that the single market is much more important for Polish economy than European funds. That there will be a lot of discussion about subsidies, about what was uh, uh, built because of this money. It's I don't say it's not important, but it is important to remember that single, single market, uh, uh, we benefited because of the single market much more, and we will benefit because of the single market even if we start to be net payer to the European Union budget. And this is very important because in many opinion polls in Poland, people say that subsidies are the biggest advantage of Poland in the EU, and it is basically not true. Single market is much more important for Polish and other European Union economies. And please have a look at the report with recommendations for the single market that we will publish uh, next 
week. Uh, thank you, Prince Michel of Liechtenstein, Maciej Bukowski, and thank you for coming for the Free Market Roadshow 2014. Thank you to our uh, co-host, Warsaw Enterprise Institute. My name is Marek Tatawa from Economic Freedom Foundation. We can continue discussion uh, uh, after this session out of this lecture hall. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight and, and see you soon at our events organized by us or Warsaw Enterprise Institute. Thank you. Bye-bye.